Hey all, this is uh, O12Boku coming at you uh, with a- another movie review after so, so long, and I uh, do apologize for that. Um, just had a bunch of personal reasons, uh, you know, money and time. You know, I, I am, like I said, I do a job on the side. That job is definitely not paying me enough, and I actually splurged. Because uh, the last program I was using is the same program, but I didn't pay for an activation key for it. So now I have the uh, 2020 version, the update version. I hope this will update on its own. If not, I will use it and update accordingly. And if I have to pay for the update, well, we'll see how I can do that. But sorry I've been gone for so long. I actually have it here on my internet it has been uh half a year since i have updated it has been my gosh i can't believe it's been uh close to six yeah six months so it's been half a year and i apologize um because i know not a whole lot of people watch my videos i've had several videos go up by 20 i see i've seen some get up to 50 right now some that have uh probably barely been watched like uh i i noticed my recent one moonraker is, has only had eight views you know say la vie you know i'm i've been trying to go back and watch my own stuff too because i've i've liked how i've grown as a presenter and i've also liked how i have you know improved for you guys over each video and i i just feel so bad that i've not been able to do as much as I've liked. And like I said, it's been money, it's been time, it's been just, I mean, mostly it's been money because I'm definitely not getting paid enough work and I've had enough money left over and this is probably gonna be my last big splurging until I get my next paycheck, which, side note, I know I'm ranting about that right now, which is gonna be mostly bills and I know everything with the, uh, I know they pro I know I may get in trouble by YouTube if I mention it on YouTube, but you know with the health scare and everything going on right now, without mentioning it by name, we're all dealing with that and you know, people have either been shopping like crazy or going nutty, but I admit I'm back to doing movie reviews and if I can do this every other week, so if I do one now, I, I also wrote this week, because like I told you guys I'm a writer. So I've also written this week, but if I can write as well, like next week for the days that I have off before I go back to work and do the movie reviews on another week, I can start balancing that out. And I'm going to try to get maybe one to two videos done a week, at least one done every week. And I hope I can work on that because I want to do that for you guys. I want to at least get regular postings up. I'm not trying to become a famous YouTube personality. If, like I said, if it does lead to something, because I every day, like even before I got this going, I put out an application for a job, and you know, I've been trying to every day to find something new, and you know, it's been hard, but you know, I'm not giving up. I'm going to enjoy my passions. I'm gonna love what I'm doing in life. If I have to have a side job, like my current job is, to pay for the bills and things like that, so be it. But in final saying to everything that's crazy that's been going on, to everybody's turmoil, to even my turmoils that I'm telling you guys about right now. I'm happy in my life. I'm happy for what I have. I'm happy that I have a great family. I'm happy that I have good friends. I'm happy that I know how to take care of myself. And I'm happy that I have things at home here that I love to enjoy. Because I admit my job right now. Has not been the greatest. I do not really like my job, and I'm just going through the motions to make money and to provide for myself. But I'm happy I have all this here. My house, my things in here, my family, my friends. Things could be a lot worse, and I'm grateful they are not. And I'm going to try to keep doing these to not just entertain myself, because these are my passions, and I want to see if anybody would reply to my passions. And I admit... Some of you have. Some of you have given me great views. Some of you have commented on my videos. The biggest one being Hunchback in Notre Dame, which I am shocked and ecstatic right now that it has had 225 views. And I know that has grown over the year or two. 
when I posted that, and that is amazing. And I'm happy that it continues to grow. I'm like I said, I'm ecstatic for anyone who watches my stuff, even if it's one person. I don't care because this is just a fun thing. But like I said, if this turns into something else, I will do it. But I hope if I ever become big, you know, that I will keep my values and not lose myself to the corporate machines and whatnot and everything. I'm not trying to get into that right now, but I know like some people do sell out for money and I hope we will not be one of them. But like I said, side tangent and stuff over with that. The one thing um, that I'm going to get at today is we are going to continue the Bond films. And uh, after watching side thing or two, after watching so many movies, guys, so many films, I am going to tell you that I'm going to uh, just start doing like TV and movie reviews too. I don't think I'm going to begin on the current crop of TV and uh, with my anime where I'm at right now. I'm on, uh, I have this thing where I have like epic anime, um, serial anime, really good, you know, classic you know, action anime. I mean, I my anime is weird. It's not as done well enough as my TV shows and my movies. But I can honestly tell you that at some point I want to start getting TV and movie in as well. Because I want to provide that for you guys. I want to provide that for you guys as well as myself. Because I think... There is great things. And one of the things that I want to review, and I don't know if I'm going to do this for my friends, because I know you guys have probably heard my voice on uh, Gray Fox's channel. If you guys, you know, know my friend uh, Gray Fox on YouTube, I've been doing stuff with his channel. We have not posted hugely anything as a group. I don't know what he's been doing at home, but I know uh, when we've done those things as a group, we've been here at my place here. But, uh, I don't know what Gray Fox is doing. Oh, I deserved it. I did that little thing. And I'm, I'm going to try to work on that too, to where I'm not always smacking, guys. So I apologize for all my videos that have smacks in it. But I'm going to just work on doing it. Because if there's one show I can't wait to review out of live action shows, I'll tell you guys. I don't know um, if you know, like, if any of you know who I am through my posts or anything like that. But I will just say... And sorry for the language here, because that's another thing I'll put up every video, you know, language, you know, the disc uh, disclaimer, everything else, stuff like that, because I don't care. You know, I may cause and swear in my videos a bit, bit, so hey, hey, but fucking Twin Peaks. That whole show, I have the entire thing from the original 1990 to 1991, those two season runs. I have I have the prequel movie and I have the limited series event, which everybody calls the third season of Twin Peaks. And I have to tell you, that is one of the best TV shows ever. It is the top tier show in my thing. And I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, I am a good fan. I am a big fan of Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones was that top tier for a long time. Then we got to the last couple seasons, and they were good, but, uh, and then season eight, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I still enjoyed season eight, but that subtlety of the last episode, I don't, I mean, I'm pretty sure people agree with me, but that subtlety of the last episode sucked. It's like, you watch it and you go, that's it, without spoiling anything, but like, yeah. And 24, I'm still a big fan of 24. I have to get through all the later seasons yet. I've not watched all 24 yet, and it's still really good from where I'm at. But Twin Peaks, man, it is so surreal, so oddly done, but yet it's captivating, it's well acted, it's creepy, it's funny, it's got elements of fantasy, sci-fi, horror, and... David Lynch is just a master at surrealism. And now, because of Twin Peaks, and I have his film Blue Velvet, which is an excellent film, I want to get all of David Lynch's filmography. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there, but that's also a big reason why I want to do TV, because I want to give you guys 
if I can, if I have to somehow do this after every episode I watch for single anime episodes, whether I upload like a couple minute videos or 15 minutes or whatnot, I want to give you guys TV and I want to do an in-depth review of Twin Peaks because it's so damn good. Everything is so damn good in that show. I mean, I know I'm probably the biggest or one of the biggest Twin Peaks marks, but guys, that show is good. If you've never given it a try and you're a fan of fantasy, science fiction, or let's even take some of your favorite shows from that genre, Stranger Things, X-Files, Sliders, Outer, Outer Limits, hell, even Twilight Zone. Even though, you know, those were really before that and probably were a precursor to what David Lynch loved. But with all that stuff, with all the weirdness, Twin Peaks is one of the top kings. I would definitely put Twin Peaks right alongside the original and remake versions of Outer Limits along with The Twilight Zone. Those three shows are like a creme de la creme of human condition, surrealism, and just... The product of how people and or things can be if you sort of put in a dash of science fiction and religion. It's just great stuff. Now, granted, I don't mean to be rambling here, but I just want to, since I'm back and I'm going to try to, sorry guys, drop my little thing here for what I was going to show you. But since I'm back and I want to be back more, I wanted to give you a heads up on what I wanted to try to do because I want to do this more. I like doing this. I am a movie buff. Movies are still one of my biggest passions. I am writing still. I am still writing like I told you guys. There's things I'm still writing being that I'm a creative writer from U of A, bachelor's degree, and that, you know, I just want to do more of these things because I've always said it and I know it was a, a huge chunk of money I just blew away on getting this today, this program. So I can record again, but it's worth it if I can do it. And as long as I can get things on track and keep them that way, thumbs up. Because I admit, guys, I've had a lot of ups and downs, but I'm always trying to look at the positive. It could always be worse. And now I'm going to finally get into it. So I'm sorry for this long-winded rant and i'm pretty sure this is going to turn a lot of people off from watching this video because believe me i've looked at my analytics i know there's some people who watch for only a few seconds and then they click off but hey that's up to you i don't mind i appreciate just for seeing that people have at least looked at my video i know that's shallow to say but you know what i still enjoy this for me because this is just meant to be a fun thing i'm not out to be famous if it becomes that at any point in time awesome but if not I'm not going to care. I love doing this. And I'm going to always re-put up thoughts on movies, even if they're the same ones I've re-seen. I'm always going to put up new movies I've watched when I get to them within the genre. I'm always going to put up certain things. And I'll probably even do, like, ten things I've liked, ten things I don't like, you know, factoids and other things. You know, These could even be short, like, one to two, three-minute videos. It doesn't matter. I'm always going to find something to put up on my stuff that I love or disliked or could use but i just figured i would tell you guys that but either way here we go this is what is going to start what we need and i'm going to start off with whoops that is upside down sorry <laughs> Yeah, she, I think it's, yeah, because Sheena Easton didn't do, do Octopussy Pussy. I think that was, uh, or sorry, Octopussy. I said Pussy, but um, Octopussy. I think that was Rita Coolidge. But yeah, For Your Eyes Only was uh, Sheena Easton. And that is such a good song. At, at least I'm thinking that one is... Yo, know, Sheena Easton. Um, try, I'm trying to think, and I believe that is 
Sheena Easton, because I remember her saying, uh, you know, for, for your eyes only and, you know, only for you, only for you. And, and like, sorry, I've got the theme song in my head. But this film is a good one. It started the John Glenn era of James Bond films, which I will admit to me and to many others, because like I've told you guys, we haven't gotten to the review yet, but GoldenEye is my top favorite. But I have to say... The 80s brand of James Bond were just is really good. And I believe it brought us back to the 60s version of James Bond with uh, Sean Connery and I'll admit George Lazenby because you guys have heard me talk about, you know, you only live twice. And, you know, those ones are really good. And this is sort of just as good. Now, these are not as good as... When Dalton takes over, and once again, I'm not going to say it had anything to really do with Roger Moore, but I think within John Glenn's last two films of License to Kill and uh, Living Daylights, he just kept upping the ante with every film. But this film had great espionage, you know, great stuff, good things just going on left and right. And it's based on basically these... Uh, yeah, these um these Russians or no, these British soldiers in the water having like a uh, type of decoder. And they have a decoder for their ships where they can track uh, spies and Russian spies and something like hits their ship to where that they you know go down and they're sinking and they're trying to like uh set off their things to where I believe they destroy that they can destroy this decoder, but as the ship is sinking, you know, the men are drowning and the one uh the one end sign is trying to reach it and the water's like keeping him back and then it just ends on that tension moment where he can't reach it and you know um as you can see where it's going, he doesn't. Because remember with my videos too, sorry I should have mentioned this there. Probably and will be spoilers. I will try not to be that guy, but I'm probably more than likely going to be that guy. So for anybody who doesn't want this movie spoiled, once again, spoilers. And, you know, they tried to stop it, but the ship still sinks. And, uh, and oh, yes, how could I forget, too? Roger Moore, who plays, you know, Bond, you know, as you see right there. In this movie, Roger Moore, who once again is back as Bond, he's one of the longest Bonds, and this was uh, near the end of his tenure. I think they said he was uh, late 40s, early 50s, but I think I think he was late 40s by this point, because when he joined uh, Bond, he was uh, in the 70s. I think he was already, uh, he wasn't in his mid-30s, he was in his late 30s, and then, you know, throughout the, throughout, uh, yes, yeah, 70, 73 to to now, you know, it's just like he kept going and, you know, he was getting older and older. And uh, so I think he was like mid to late 40s in this one. And I forgot, he he's at a grave site. And John Glenn was awesome to bring this back, to bring this into the continuity. We have Roger Moore as Bond visiting uh, his former wife, the one who was killed by Bullfeld, Tracy's grave. He leaves... Uh, flowers by Tracy's grave. You know, you can see he's got a somber look on his face. He's not saying anything. He, he takes a look at the gardener who knows he's visiting at the cemetery, you know, leaves the flowers for Tracy. And, you know, he just goes on his way. It was a quick thing to, you know, visit his dead wife, which yeah, granted they were only married for the 20 or so minutes that they were, but, but Mike, as you know, if you're really in love with somebody, it lasts a lifetime. And this is why I'm glad John Glenn brought it in because even though they're not the same binds, Lazenby is no longer there and it's more, you can keep the character the same because the tropes stay different actors, but same character like the doctor from Dr. Who, which I've also do Dr. Who reviews. So, Hey, Hey, but that's very similar to what we get on here. And and to me, that's, that's an awesome take. But as he leaves the flowers and like, I believe, uh, a, a, an agent or no, a pilot and an, an, an agent pilot comes up 
tells Bond to get in the helicopter because he's needed back at MI6, gets in the helicopter, the pilot gets electrocuted, and then you hear a very eerily voice of Blofeld, who we don't get to see the front of his face, but he's in a wheelchair, he has his cap, he's, um, he's, uh, obviously we see him messed up from, like, obviously I'm going to say he probably dealt with permanent injuries, because when, uh, Sean Connery was playing Bond again for uh, Diamonds Are Forever. We saw Blofeld as Charles Gray trying to get away in that small little sub of his. And it got blown up with the rig. And we never saw if Blofeld died or not. We just assumed. But here Blofeld was. And that was John Glenn's idea. Was He wanted to finally get rid of Blofeld. Because we never got to see it as fans. He wanted to give the fans a payoff for his first part back into this and he wanted to have bond here roger moore's bond finally take care of him so we can finally close the chapter of that story and like it's actually a very creepy beginning because blofeld is you know playing around with him he's like oh don't worry about because he kills the pilot and he's like oh don't worry about that mr bond what am i less useful people and he sort of talks like that like a weird british slash russian accent i don't know why but that's what they give this guy who has Blofeld. And Blofeld is back to being like sort of like the Donald Pleasance and Telly Savala, Savalas era where he's bald. He's got the gray sort of beige brown suit again. He has his cat. He's in a wheelchair. He's, we obviously see him with a neck brace on. And he's he's like on a top of the building just flying Bond around, teasing him that he's going to crash him into something or or make him crash into the river tent. I, I think that's the Thames, the ta the, ta the Thames or the Thames, however you pronounce it. And like he's fooling around with him. And when he's getting ready to do it, we see uh, Bond get out of the helicopter. You know, Blofeld tries to shake him off. And, you know, Bond gets into the driver's seat. And uh, Blofeld's like, oh, but you can't stop it now. You don't know where my, uh, my tracking device or whatnot is. And he finds it and he... Uh, disables it and he's basically pretending like he can't fly the helicopter as Blofeld's flying him in buildings and flying him out and Bond gets control and as he gets control Blofeld notices Bond's coming after him he's trying to get away he grabs uh Blofeld's uh wheelchair and Blofeld is like freaking out like he's like he's like no stop Mr. Bond stop stop don't do this to me stop and you know he's like freaking out badly Knowing that Bond has him right where he knows him, and James Bond sees these uh, smokestacks in this factory. So he has Blofeld hooked on the helicopter by the wheelchair, goes near one of the smokestacks, and he says, uh, forget if he says, you know, feel free to drop in or whatnot. I would do it in the accent, but I would, I don't want to because I wish I knew the line, but he says, uh, you know, feel free to pop in or something or drop in, and uh, or, you, or did you want to drop in? Something like that. But Bond drops him, and Blofeld goes down the smokestack with a hilarious sound effect, which sort of does, in a way, cheapen it. But it was sort of funny, because it becomes a funny scene how Bond got the upper hand. But it was still awesome to see Bond deal with Blofeld. And you hear Blofeld go down like, whoop, like that. And he's like, Mr. Bond! You know, and we obviously get the idea that James Bond had finally killed Blofeld, and we finally see that story arc come to the end. That was a brilliant thing of John Glenn as director to do. It was cool that he wanted to have that, that it was, and it was a great opening for the film. It was great, and, and it was very enjoyable, because we finally ended one of the longest story arcs in the movie franchise. I don't know about the books, but in the movie franchise, and I think I mentioned this before, but all the way up to, um, I think it was from the world is, yeah, all the way up to the world is not enough. All that stuff was loosely based on, uh, or, well, loosely based and based on, with, with a bit of both, basically, for all those movies, uh, Ian, Ian Fleming's short stories. Because Ian Fleming's wrote uh, James Bond short stories along with his novels, and a lot of these films were based off of the uh, short stories where a lot of these stories come from, some of the action scenes come from, and stuff like that. So that, I thought, was very...
This is oh no 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 I forgot yeah this is the start of where Robert Brown takes over as M because Bernard Lee had recently died and uh, Robert Brown uh or no 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 I forgot Robert Brown wasn't in this one this one was with uh, Jeffrey Keane who was the uh, who was the um. Yeah, the minister. Yeah, the minister of defense, and it dealt with uh, uh, Walter Gotel, who played uh, General Gogol. Ge General Gogol is featured heavily throughout the um, the eighties movies. I, I think he was even featured in uh, uh, Living Daylights, if I remember too. But he was featured in every eighties movie, I think, minus. License to Kill. So, you know, Walter Gotell comes back, and, and he was featured in a lot of the 70s ones, too. He was in uh, Spy Who Loved Me is, like, a pretty big main character. He was in Moonraker for a cameo. I, I believe he was a pretty big main character for this one because uh, Christatos, who's uh, played by Julian Glover, who I'll get into in a bit more in depth, Christatos was trying to give the machine to... General Gogol, because General Gogol for throughout the rest of these films sort of plays as the anti-hero slash villain, because it, it's not like in Spy Who Loved Me, where he was working with the British. He's like the anti-hero slash villain in this one, because, you know, everything going on still with the height of the Cold War and things like that within the 1980s here. And Christatos is going to give this Enigma code machine to uh, General Gogol. Because he's the one who wanted it, and Christatos is like a, a seller of secrets to the highest bidder. And uh, we get into uh, Melina, who's played by uh, Carol Bouquet, who is the, uh, um, I believe, French or Canadian French actress who falls in love with uh, Bond in this one. And her father um, is a marine biologist, where she uh, comes home to visit him, and her father is killed by uh, Christatos. On orders, because Christatos and her father had worked on um, this subbing plot, and or like or like yeah, like oh the sub that helped sink the ship or the weapons that helped sink the ship. I forgot exactly what it was. I've only seen this one once all the way through, so sorry if my uh, mind sort of wanders if I can't remember exactly what happened. Because like I said, I need to go back and sometimes we watch these, but. I think I remember good enough to where I can do the review, but yeah, you know, just bear with me, guys. But yeah, it was whatever um, Christatos had with the guy, the machine, or the tools, or the equipment, but he killed uh, Molina's father for that. And Molina spends the film wanting revenge on Christatos, trying to find him for killing you know, her father, doing what she needed to do, and Bond goes throughout this film trying to... Uh, dissuade her of that and seeing that you know because of what vengeance has let him down which bond still has that vengeful streak but at the same time he's like hey you know what this is my life i'm a british spy i work for world peace i try to put things right but you know it never ends this continues for me you know this is who i am i am basically a cop and agent by nature melina you don't have to be this. Please don't go down this. You don't know how dangerous vengeance is. So Melina's conscience plays throughout that role. Um, we have a uh, little oh, second, guys. I hopefully, I hopefully with this new program, I can edit out better than I can. But I gotta get some water. I'll be back. Thing what I'll do for right now too is I will leave uh, my pitcher and my water cup near me so I can at least have something to grab while I do these. Hopefully I don't spill anything on it, but because I don't know if you guys do the last um uh laptop I had I ruined by spilling pop on it, and my little brother gave me this really nice laptop, so don't want to ruin it really. So, <laughs> but um. You have, uh, uh, yeah.
He was in the uh, Flash Gordon movie uh, with uh, Max von Saito and Sam Jones and all those guys. And I was I was blown away that he was in the uh, Flash Gordon movie. But, it, but, you know, hey, it works in many ways. Topol was a good actor. Topol was good here. Uh, he, in many ways, um, I believe, is a part of a resistance movement that is trying to prove for Christatos and his men as well as the Russians, to prevent them from damaging his country, which I believe was the French Fr French and or Swiss countryside, whichever, uh, you know, Colombo is a part of. And he's just trying to put in an end to, you know, Christophus' plans and what he uh, represents. And it's just funny that, because Col Colombo does a great job in this movie. He does. And it's just funny to know that, uh, or Topol, who plays Columbo does a great job in this movie. It's just funny to know that Topol was also in the uh, Flash Gordon movie. And I'm like, because, yeah, I never heard of this guy. And then when I see him in Flash Gordon, I'm like, oh, is that what he's also from? Let's see. We have uh, BB, who is uh, Lynn Holly Johnson, who I don't know much of what she did. She did an all right job in this movie. Not the, uh, not the best Bond girl, but she was definitely decent from some of the other ones we get beforehand from this. And some of the ones we uh, get after, of course. I mean, personally, I think all the women are better. Ho Holly Goodhead, I think, was one of the worst. Because even though Britt Eklund as Mary Goodnight plays that ditz in The Man with the Golden Gun, I will take Ditsy over. James, the spores, they're coming. Stop them. Wow, is that really how you acted? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's my opinion. There's a lot of people. There's some people out there who probably really loved Holly Goodhead. Hopefully, or hopefully for more than just being, because she, she did look hot in that movie. So hopefully more for just being hot. But Holly Goodhead was not <laughs> the, the, the best choice. Or, like, the way she played the character wasn't good. So that could have been the character, too. So whether that was Lewis Gilbert's direction or what not, you know, I don't know, but hey, but, um, Lynn Holly Johnson plays, uh, BB, and BB is the, uh, niece of Christatos, where she is, uh, training to, uh, like, win the Olympics, because she's, like, an Olympic or, or, you know, popular figure skater, I think that's what, uh, Christatos was saying she was trying to do, was get into the Olympics, so he's hoping that she can be really good and, you know, great of everything. <laughs> and uh, she basically plays as definitely, you know, supporting character roles. She doesn't really have anything big. Uh, she sort of catches on that her uh, uncle Christatos uh, is involved in this crime ring and, you know, everything else that could go forward with it. And uh, she learns that she's uh, near the end of the movie when they're in the mountains near in a villa with Christatos where Christatos is hoping to deliver the uh, British decoder to uh, General Gogol. She uh, turns against her uncle, you know, doesn't want to be a part of his evil plots, doesn't want to, like, learn how to be a figure skate skater under him anymore. And she sort of, I forget what she exactly does, but she helps Bond and, you know, uh, Topol's men and uh, Molina get into his compound, you know, take Christatos and the men down, and uh, near the end of the film, after Christatos has been defeated, Topol takes uh, BB on to help learn her figure skating, and it looks like, you know, a bit more of the shebang bang, but, you know, hey, maybe that's what they were going to do, but it, it definitely looked like that at the end of the movie when uh, when uh, Bond says, oh, I think, you know, Colum I think Columbo will help you out with what you need that. You know, it's sort of like, so, oh, hey, hey, hey. And then, um, finally, uh, I mean, there's more other people, but I, I need to definitely see this movie again, because I don't remember all these characters, um, very well, especially, uh, so I apologize to the characters I'm about to name, don't know them very well, uh, Liesel, uh, Brink, uh, Locke, uh, Kregler, and Havelock. I think, uh, I think some of those guys were under Christatos. Some of those were also Columbo's men. I think Locke is the assassin who kills a lot of Bond's allies. And um, I'll get into that in a moment. 
But Christatos is brilliantly, brilliantly played by Julian Glover, another great actor to play the villain. I'm surprised that Christatos was billed so low in this movie, but still, I mean, he, he's a great effect to it because Christatos actually first, me, first meets Bond as an ally. Like, he's the go-between to MI6, um, the Russians, the French, and, and a lot of the allies who were against the uh, Cold, Cold War, the war on communism, and everything else like that. So he turns out to be an ally. But as things start to go awry, uh, Bond's, you know, confidant and uh, partner in this movie gets killed again. You know, he finds out that Christatos was behind it. Christatos tries to have Bond killed several times throughout this film. And we learn that Christatos was going to sell, like I said earlier, the decoder to General Gogol because he sells world secrets to the highest builders. So he's a... Uh, He's a smuggler and a seller of, you know, just illegal information and goods. And, you know, if Russia got their hands on this British decoder, it would really undermine, I think, I think it was both the British and Americans, you know, spy rings and Russia would have access to all that and be able to break through them, kill their top spies and everything else. And so, you know, this is why Bond had, a, had to um, get this back. And, you know, Christatos just played things very suave. You know, Julian Glover usually does play, play villains, but he was suave. You can see this maniacal nature underneath him. You know, like, at first we meet him, he's very kind, but then it switches to calculating and maniacal. You know, Julian Glover plays that so very well. And, I mean, I have to say, he did a great job as Christatos and the villain of this movie. And, basically, he meets his maker... You know, so once again, spoiler, guys, he, he meets his maker at the end of this film, because like I said, Bond tries to talk Molina since uh, Christatos had a hand in killing Molina's father. She, uh, Bond tries to stop uh, Christatos from, or no, tries to stop Molina from killing uh, Christatos with, I, I believe it was um, a gun she had, or she, she had something. She had like a gun or, or yeah, she had Christatos' gun. And what happens is, is Bond talks her down. I think she tosses Christatos' gun at her feet, or there was another gun or something towards uh, Christatos' foot or something or near him. And what happens is, is you have... Oh, shoot, sorry. Yeah, I blanked on it. You have, uh, like, her throw down the weapon. Christatos picks up a gun. I think he was going to shoot both either her and or James Bond. And then... Uh, Columbo has a crossbow, shoots Christatos in the chest, I think, with the crossbow, kills Christatos. Uh, General Gogol comes. You know, Bond has the uh, British decoder. Gogol shows up. Bond is holding it. Gogol literally holds out his hand, even though he knows who Bond is and Bond is with the British government. He holds out Bond's hand to take, you know, or holds out, you know, his hands take the decoder from Bond, and he's thinking Bond's going to do this because I believe Gogol has two armed guards with him, and it looks like they're getting ready to shoot Bond, and Bond just tosses the decoder over the side of the mountain to where it smashes on the mountain and into the sea below, and Gogol just sort of, like, laughs and shrugs it off, and then he just, like, takes off, like, oh, well, we'll get the next piece of evidence so that was a little funny but see that's what i'm saying like where gogol's the villain you know he was trying to get these secrets from christatos and then it failed when christatos died and then he thought bond was going to give him the decoder and then bond just you know greatly tosses it into the uh, mountain and the sea and you know that would that was a great thing it's just that same gogol <laughs> The east, yeah, the eastern part of Europe and possibly some people in Asia off, given, you know, 
once again, the fighting communists. And, you know, you don't want to portray everything as villains. Otherwise, it'll be looked at as a muck, and that can be a dangerous thing. So, yes. So those are the actors. And, like, notable things uh, that are good in this movie. Uh, Bill Conti did the music. And I know, I, I know Bill Conti has done other music things, and I forget which. But the score to this movie was pretty good. It was uh, it was a good one, and you know, I mean, very thorough bits of music, nice themes of playing for your eyes only when uh, he needed to, and you know, it was it was just a very nice score from him because uh, John Barry, I believe, still does a few scores for these films, but yeah, he wasn't able to do this one, but it was done by uh, Bill Conti in this one, and Bill Conti does. A pretty good job. Some of the stunts in this movie are nicely well done. Um, I'll go with uh, like the, the best one that I think everyone knows where Bond in this one, when he's trying to get to Christatos' estate, he's climbing up the mountains while, while both Molina and Colombo and some of their men are shooting people, you know, uh, up top with crossbows because they had to climb this mountain and, you know, Bond's climbing the highest peak before he can get everybody up so he's doing this to where you know he's trying to get up there and like you know like sometimes your know, things are coming loose because of the battles if the other people are trying to take you know Christophus's men out and then I believe one guy sees Bond climbing up the mountain and he tries to climb down to get to him and there's this like I don't think it's that long but there's this brief fight on with mountain climbers to where I think Bond like knocks the guys like I think it was like using a wire or cable but he knocks them loose and sends the guy plummeting down below it was a great scene but that whole mountain climbing scene oof what a what a nice visual shot and stunt and you know the battle and everything that was nicely well done the one part that I like that I wanted to tell you guys about because I admit the battle on the ice rink was cool where you know Bond's fighting the hockey players that was a cool thing with Roger Moore and all them to put together but I've got to say after they're done raiding like and I think it was a compound in Italy that they were raiding that Bond was raiding with uh Colombo and whatnot is you have um, I think, once again, the guy's name was uh, Locke, who was the uh, assassin in this movie. And, and Locke was trying to get away, and, you know, he was in a car, and he was uh, trying to get away. And what happens is, is uh, I think Bond threw a grenade, or he uh, shot Locke, and Locke sort of, like, hit a tree that was once again near a hill cliffside. There was no water, but it was a very steep cliffside. And, you know, Locke got shot or something, but he was still alive. And he crashed into this tree. And what happens is, is uh, Roger Moore had issues wanting to do the scene. Because, like, he you know, like he admits, I think, in the audio commentary of this movie, or the special features, that he's pacifistic. Um, that's why his fight scenes aren't like Connery's or Lazenby's because he doesn't truly like to hurt people and he didn't want to do a lot of that deep killing, which, you know, why some of his kills in these movies seem a little comical because he doesn't want to be that cold-fisted guy. But in this movie, because of what happened to, uh, I believe the guy who was killed was, uh, I think I think that's who Havelock was. Like, his partner's name was Havelock, I think. I think that's who Havelock is. And, um... When he has him on the rope, like, uh, Locke had left a pin on Havelock's dead body when Bond was at, the, yeah, that's what happened when Bond went to the ice skating rink. Locke had found Havelock, and he had, uh, and he had killed him. And, you know, that ended up being a terrible thing. And, you know, like, oh man, Roger Moore sold that beautifully. He was ticked that Havelock hadn't been killed. And so, like I said, getting back to the car part, when Locke is hurt in the car and he's trying to get out, you have Bond come up to him. He's standing right next to the car and he's like, he's like, I believe this was, I believe this was, was yours from Havelock. And he tie any, and, or no, or no, wait, no, 
he, he's like, he's like, I believe this was yours. And he, tie, and he, and he, you know, throws the pin that was left on Havlock's body to lock. Lock catches it, and then I know Roger Moore didn't like doing this because it was brutal. But at times, you know, Bond hates it when his friends are killed, and that's why his whole vengeance thing is that because if you kill his allies, Bond gets pissed, and he pushes ha- or locks car over the side like he just puts the foot on the car pushes it over the sides like he could have helped lock out but he doesn't help lock out he just pushes lock over the side to where i believe uh lock's car i can't remember if the car exploded you know if they did a big explosion or if they just had you know lock oh yeah lock's car just went crushed and just went down the cliff hillside and i think like it rolled a few times and then i think it finally just crushed the roof of the car um, underneath when it flipped and the car was upside down and obviously uh, Locke was killed and Locke was dead at that point. And I know Moore didn't like doing it. Roger Moore did not like doing it, but I have to say that's probably one of Roger Moore's best moments in his films. I mean, other than his interactions with like Christopher Lee and of course coming up when we get to uh, um, oh yeah, View to a Kill, where he had awesome moments with Christopher Walken. It was just, you know, I mean, that moment was one of the best. And I think a lot of fans said that was probably Roger Moore's, James Bond's best moments within that film, too. So it was really cool. And I mean, overall, guys, I mean, this isn't the strongest film, but, you know, it's got all the James Bond stuff in it. It's very fun. The story is, I'm going to say, good to decent. You know, characters were well done. The score, like I said, the score by Bill Conti is good. It's produced well. I think, uh, yeah, it was, um, hold on here. I think we have, uh, yeah, it's still produced by Albert R. Broccoli. He was still producing him at this point. I think he produced it all the way up to, uh, License to Kill. I think he maybe even been, was still the producer for Goldmine. I may have been wrong wrong about that because he may have died by that point but i know he was still producing by the time they did license to kill so he's still a producer you know john glenn what a great directorial start for this film and you know richard maybaum and michael g wilson who i think michael g wilson was the uh, yeah he was the executive producer by this so credit to him for doing this too and being a part of it and being you know Great with the stuff, and, you know, great writer. Richard Maybaum still was writing at this point, so Richard Maybaum was still putting out pretty good bangers. So this film is good. And I would give I would give this one, I think I gave it, like, a very high 7 to maybe, like, a low 8 out of 10. So that's still pretty good to, you know, a good film. And, you know, for, for your eyes only, it is great. It's not the best Bond film, but it's a good one. So until then, guys... Hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you thought about for your eyes only in the comments below if you want or like what you guys thought or, you know, just view. But like once again, if you guys can leave comments, appreciate it too because I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on these too. But until then, this is 012 Boku coming at you with another movie review and I will see you later, all right?